Hello, Spooklings. I'm Jason. And I'm Kathy. And we're the hosts of the weekly podcast, All Hallows Eve Podcast. We are a husband and wife duo with a passion for anything spooky, macabre, and true crime, sprinkled with our own twist of comedy. We explore topics such as the history of Halloween, the butcher of Plainfield, Focus Pocus 2, urban legends, superstitions, and more. So come join us as we go down the rabbit hole that is All Hallows Eve Podcast. Listen and follow us at allhallowsevepodcast.com or your favorite podcast provider. Stay spooky, my friends. everybody welcome to films and fermentation tonight is our 99th episode 99 episodes tonight oh uh so <laughs> tonight is our 99th episode we're films and fermentation hey movie and alcohol podcast i'm leah i'm kevin i'm mike we're three friends who like to talk shit about movies while getting shit faced. This episode tonight, number 99, we are going to be spending some time with one of the most original filmmakers that Hollywood has to offer. We're going to be looking at the career of one Tim Burton. Uh, we decided to go with this tonight because it is the 35th anniversary of one of his biggest hits, that being Beetlejuice. Dare I say it a third time and see what happens? Episode 99 The Kooky Career of Tim Burton. Don't forget to drop us an email at filmsofermentation at gmail.com or visit linktree.com slash films of fermentation to find all of our social media podcast links. We are now using Buzzsprout as our hosting platform. Let me tell you a little bit about Buzzsprout. Podcasting isn't hard when you have the right partners. The team at Buzzsprout is passionate about helping you succeed. Join over 100,000 podcasters already using Buzzsprout to get their message out. We switched to Buzzsprout, and it's been a game changer for us. New analytics, much more downloads. Uh, just a whole bunch of, of options that we didn't have before. So if you want to upgrade, change to Buzzsprout. Follow the link that I will be posting on our show notes. Let Buzzsprout know that we sent you there. Speaking of Buzzsprout, real quick, mm -hmm. did you get the email? We had 130 downloads last week. Yeah, and we have 293 as of today. So, yeah, we're, we're, doing, we're, we're getting there. We're getting there. Some of the other guys on Buzzsprout uh, on the on our podcast uh, uh, group who have been using Buzzsprout over the last year or so already already reached like a couple thousand downloads. So nice. you know, I'm, hope, I'm hoping it does the same for us. Well, we're, so, we're uh, as always because we are a movie and alcohol podcast. What is the alcohol we are imbibing in tonight, gentlemen? <laughs> I'll go first. I am imbibe, inviting, inviting on, uh, this is a brewery exclusive. It is the River, Her River Horse Kirsch Noir, which is a chocolate cherry imperial stout. Okay, it is uh, River Horse Brewing, which is up in Ewing. My uh, wife and I went up there a couple weeks ago. A uh, nice little place. It's 10% alcohol by volume. Uh, oh, it's got a color um, measure on here. 37 SRM. Anybody know what the hell that means? I have no idea. No idea. Okay. It says, historically, uh -huh. imperial stouts are a formidable style brewed with to withstand long voyages. 
To honor the century's long tradition of this luxurious style, we've added an extra layer of complexity with cherries. Velvety on the palate, but strong enough to accentuate bold, roasted chocolate notes. This beauty reminds us of a slice of rich Black Forest Chateau. There's no need to amp the booziness with traditional cherry brandy, but there is a requirement to savor every sip. So that's what I'm starting with. So the, SR, the SRM is a beer color chart. Yes. So and this is a 37 on the SRM. So it says a standard reference. It's called the standard reference method. The most common value used in the U.S. to measure beer color. Uh, developed by the American Society of Brewing Chemists in 1950. As a scientific standard for identifying beer color. And 37... Looks like it's you know because it's like a darker beer. That's one of the higher numbers. So it's like the it looks like the higher you go, the darker the beer is. Mm. So I think if you're drinking like a one, it means you're drinking like Budweiser because it changes piss water. Light. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> makes your piss. There's some Clydesdale piss for you. Yeah. <laughs> this is a nice dark color, like a Coca-Cola. Uh, Michael, what are you drinking this evening? I am drinking. A Jim Beam Kentucky Cooler Lemonade Sweet Tea. Five mm. percent alcohol by volume. You sounds good. Come on, I got another one later. <laughs> so uh, I have a beer recommendation for you, Mike. Uh, last yeah. night I stopped at this uh, this pub in Doylestown to pick up these uh, some pizza that Katie and I really like from there. Okay. And uh, while I was waiting for the pizzas to cook, I had a beer, and it was an Omagong. Wit beer. Okay, I think uh, I've seen it's, it's simply just called Omegon Wit, Wit, but it. Yeah, was, I think I've seen it. Yeah, it's very good. It's because I know you like the Wit beers. It's it's mm -hmm. uh, it was very clean, very like crisp, not like a, not very not bitter at all. Really, really good. Nice. And then I also had one of the Spotten, uh, double box the other night, which I hadn't had before, and uh, I really enjoyed that. But for tonight, yeah, for tonight. I decided I was going to try to do a mixed drink and, and, you know, like one of the, the theme movie theme related mixed drinks, like there's a drink called the Beetlejuice. Mm -hmm. There was a, a drink called the Corpse Bride. Uh, but I'm like, you know what? Fuck it. I, don't feel like doing all yeah, I don't feel like doing that work. So I'm drinking beer because uh, between my friend, Kevin, my friend, Mike and myself, there's a lot of beer in my fridge right now. <laughs> and I need to start like plowing through it a little bit. So I have a loose theme here. Because I'm drinking a Munchen on Pumpkin from uh, Devil's Backbone, one of the ones that Mike gave me. And I say it's loose theme because I figured, hey, in Sleepy Hollow, the Headless Horseman does have a pumpkin for a head for a while. It is true. <laughs> it's true. I got a loose theme going. Very loose. Mm -hmm. hey, Mike, any history for us this week, Mike? In this day in film history. 1941, James Stewart is inducted into the Army, becoming the first major American movie star to wear the, a military uniform in World War II. And then? And then, three years later, in 1944, American movie star Jimmy Stewart flies his 12th combat mission, leading the second bomb wing in an attack on Berlin. Get them, get them Nazis. So it's like not only is he the first American major movie star, but he didn't, like, take it easy. He wasn't, like, sitting behind a desk or anything. You know, yeah. Some bitch was getting his hands dirty. He was getting some Nazi... He was killing I some just, Nazi guys. Like and, and then, thinking, and in then. 1950, Jimmy Stewart creates the uh, the the Air Force um, <laughs> and, and, and starts the Air Force, and that's how the Air Force came around. We found that so, out earlier. That's the, 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 Army, the Army Air... Uh, Air, whatever you, you said it was Air called, Corps. like Air Corps was not big enough for, for Jimmy Stewart, so they had to create a whole branch for him. I gotta spread my wings, I gotta fly. <laughs> Man, I gotta I, fly. I, 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 I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take out uh, as, as many of these Nazi fuckers as I can. <laughs> every, time, every time a Nazi dies, I get more wings. <laughs> I, I got too many wings. So, 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 the metal, you... This is for you, Juju. <laughs> That's probably true, yeah. too. He probably got some more wings on his uniform for every Nazi. <laughs> so the Department of the Air Force came out in September 18th, 1947. 
Oh wow! So, so you get only like, three years after that uh, that yeah. mission to Berlin. That's pretty cool. Uh, I added the third fact here, and it's just that this this year is the 35th anniversary of Beetlejuice. Uh, yeah. Classic comedy, classic Tim Burton film. One of the reasons why we decided to do uh, a Tim Burton episode for this our 99th show. And the sequel's in the works. Sequel, it is. There is a sequel in the works. And I heard a rumor, my wife actually told me this, that um, the sequel is going to involve Lydia's daughter. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lydia, mm-hmm. of course, mm-hmm. is the Winona Ryder character. And that it's possibly might be played by Jenna Ortega, who plays Wednesday. And I'm like, well, that's kind of that's kind of like on the nose casting. And I would feel like she's being like typecast at that point if you're going to put her in another yeah. Tim Burton film. Now, you see, what I heard is that the sequel is going to have Lydia's daughter, uh, Lydia's uh, child, but it's actually mm-hmm. going to be her son who hides out in his, his uh, fort in the woods and ends up disappearing into this whole uh, upside down world, right? And then his friends <laughs> gather to try to, to help. In the is, his name, is his name Will Byers? That's right. That's right. That's exactly <laughs> it. That's, uh, that would be funny. It's like the Beetlejuice sequel <laughs> is just a loose adaptation of Stranger Things. <laughs> you know, it's a good thing Kevin brings the pretty. Because that's about all he's bringing. <laughs> I bring the funny, too. God the funny. damn it. I, I, I enjoyed that joke. I got the reference. <laughs> I got it, too. <laughs> it just was a law. <laughs> Speaking oh, of uh, speaking of excellent TV shows, everybody caught up on The Mandalorian. Oh yes, yeah. really good this season. <laughs> oh, and it, what I heard is that it's not getting the ratings. Like it's slow on the really? ratings this year. Yeah, yeah. People aren't as hyped about it for some reason. I'm very hyped. I love it. I'm enjoying it. I like. Seeing I've enjoyed Grogu every episode armor. so far. Yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, we got some. We got some Gogu backstory this week. I know we got a lot of backstory in the last two episodes. And can we believe who the Jedi savior was for Grogu? <laughs> it's a me, it's Mario. Me, Mario. <laughs> it's a me, Jaja. I'm sorry, spoiler, guys. Yeah, uh, it's really the actor spoiler, who yeah. plays the Jedi is the actor who Ahmed did Shark Best. <laughs> Ahmed Best. I thought it was a good way of giving him a little, like, you know, redemption. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, actually, I think there was a children's Jedi show. I hadn't caught any of it, but there's this kid's Jedi show, and he is a Jedi. He plays the Jedi Master on that who uh, who's in the who's in the the Mandalorian. Okay. So yeah, because I was fun fact. With the See, fun, fun fact, fact, Mike. Funny fun, fun facts and the pretty. Fun time. Fun time. I was uh, I was uh, uh, um, like I I wasn't familiar with the character, but I was. I was like, oh, well, uh, my best. <laughs> it was kind of cool to see him. Uh, synopsis, according to... Oh, I'm sorry, Mike, do you have a must-try beer or craft destination for this evening? I have a craft destination. This is Parish Brewing Company, 29, uh, 229 Jared Drive in Bruchard, Louisiana. Louisiana. Andrew Godley started Parish Brewing Company out of his garage, and since then, the brewing bre- brewery's beers have become so popular that he has a difficult time keeping up with the demand. Their flagship beer is Cane Break, a refreshing wheat ale brewed with, a, with cane syrup from a nearby company called Steen's Cane Syrup. In 2013, Parish released a double IPA called Ghost in the Machine that was met with similar high acclaim. Parrish does a monthly brewery brewery Parrish does monthly brewery only special releases on top of his six year round beers. To stop stop by the brewery for a tour, grab a flight from the tap tap room, and then take some delicious beer to go. So, uh, shout out to our friend Donald from You, Me, and a Movie. And Pizza. Yep. Uh, who is Real from pizza. Louisiana. And uh, I feel like that might have been one of the things he talked about on the show when he was, uh, when he was a guest. I think it was. It sounds familiar. Well, mm-hmm. I'll, have to, I'll have to contact him or, or like re-listen to that episode or something and see if that was one of the beers uh, he talked about. Because I remember him telling us if we ever get down to Louisiana, there's a couple places we should try it out. Yep. I want We're going to add that. Jambalaya. Yeah, we're going to add that to the Films and Fermentation live tour, because uh, I'd love to 
go to New Orleans one day. So. <laughs> if we were to do that, if we were to go, you know, on we a, have on to hit tour, all 50 states. Is a a live well, I think we'd have to definitely check out um, like movie sets and, and things like like visit the areas of the movies from the cities that we're going to. You know, oh, I would do that definitely. The, now, here's the thing, though: we have to actually start making money off the podcast first. That's... <laughs> I will start selling my underwear. Yeah. Okay. So if, as long as we, you know, if we start getting some more downloads, we can start getting some advertisements, and then maybe, just maybe, maybe. Maybe in about 12 years. <laughs> yeah. If we're still doing this podcast, you know, when we reach our 200th episode, maybe. Just maybe we can do that. We can do the, the country we can do We can do one city in our <laughs> Uh So our synopsis, according to Glip for last week's episode, uh, last week uh, was our tribute to The Quiet Man, loudly remembering The Quiet Man for St. Patty's Day. Uh, our uh, synopsis according to Glip is, of course, brought to you by Newsly. Newsly is an all-in-one audio super app for iOS or Android. If you'd like to have the news read to you in a natural human voice, go to newsly.me today. If you use the promo code and ferment, you can get the first month premium subscription for free. Stop scrolling, start listening. Newsly.me. So, according to Glip last week, <laughs> the meeting we had a meeting last week we didn't have a show or a podcast we had a meeting the meeting mm. focused on jeopardy questions tonight voice of the cherry raiders of the lost ark setting oh, of the film dower dowry elements of the movie and the reign of henry only one of those say had anything to do with the movie we talked about the only one of those, there's like two of those that I remember talking about. There was the dowry and the Jeopardy question that Kevin brought. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't well, remember. Is... What the fuck is the reign of Henry? Yeah, that's what I want to know. What the fuck is the <laughs> reign of Henry? Henry the, the reign of Henry. Are you talking about Henry the last week? I don't remember talking about anything. With Henry I don't remember Henry. Henry. Uh, the setting in a film, I think, is when we were talking about the cinematography. Probably. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, I don't know that where Raiders of the Lost Ark. Oh, Raiders of the Lost Ark was the Jeopardy question. Yeah. And the voice of the cherry. <laughs> the voice of the cherry. That can be in so many different ways. Oh, God. I have no idea. Half of the shit that Glip pulled out of the show last week. I was both perplexed and disappointed by this uh, summary. <laughs> Uh, notes. I have some notes from the last show, which I haven't done in a while. Uh, last week we were talking about recasting the quiet man. And even though we feel that a reboot of the movie is uh sacrilege, mm-hmm. I couldn't help thinking about thinking about it a little bit. And I came up with my own, like sort of like recasting of the movie. If there was a modern day one. Mm-hmm. And I came up with this, uh, Sean Thor- Thornton, the John Wayne part. I, uh, put in Chris Pine, uh, best known for playing Captain Kirk in the Star Trek reboots. Yeah, uh, I thought he would be a really good like John Wayne substitute. Uh, for Mary Kate, I went with Saoirse Ronan because she is an Irish act- actress, and I would put Saoirse Ronan in every fucking movie I ever made. Uh, for Redwell Donahue, I went with Colin Farrell, mm-hmm. sort of like your statesman Irish actor. For Mechaline, I went with an Irish comedian, Adam uh, who's who's done a few shows, done a few TV shows and a couple movies, probably not as well-known a name in America, but he's really funny. His name's Chris O'Dowd. He was mm-hmm. in a, a BBC sitcom called The IT Crowd. Um, he was in the movie This Is 40, Judd Apatow he film. Was in, he, was in, uh, he was in Bride's, Bride's Maze. Maze. Yeah. yeah, so yeah. He's, he's a really funny Irish comedian. I thought he would be a good Michelin. He was in uh, Thor, the, the dark, the dark thing, the dark Thor in dark. Thor in the dark. Dark world. The dark, dark world. Dark, yeah. dark world. He was a, a very brief role. Mm-hmm. I think he's a little too tall for McLean. Yeah, he's taller, but he's also he plays a really good drunk character. If you ever watch the IT crowd, so yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then for the priests, for the Catholic priests, I have uh, Kenneth Branagh, and for mm-hmm. the uh, Protestant on Reverend Playfair, Ewan McGregor. Hmm. I tried to go with actors who were either Irish or could play Irish really well. I didn't hear Liam Neeson in there anywhere. 
I I tried to squeeze him in there somewhere, and I'm like, I don't know. Liam Neeson, I think, is a little too intense for the quiet man. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm ready to find you. I I'm going to see him playing the Catholic priest to the fish and then starts yelling at her yeah. about it. You know, <laughs> I thought about him for Redwell Donaher, but I was like, no, there's no way he wouldn't kill Sean Thornton. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we will be uh, taking a short break to bring you some promos from our friends at Today We Laughed and Learn and the Fandalorians. Uh, when we come back from that short break, we'll be going into our main segment, the kooky career of Tim Burton. Hi, I'm Chris. And I'm Deb. And we host a pretty fun podcast called Today We Laughed and Learned. You know, this is where we discuss all the things we should have learned, but, well, never did. And we have quite a few laughs along the way. Today We Laughed and Learned with Chris and Deb. We're curious about everything. Experts on nothing. Come find us wherever you get your podcasts. Hello, everybody. Let me ask you a question. When you were a kid, did you ever wonder what teachers talked about in the teacher's lounge? You probably didn't miss much. It's usually boring stuff like grading papers, lesson planning, and then figuring out the new train schedule. Train schedule? Well, I teach in the city. But sometimes at one of the not-so-cool tables in the back of the teacher's lounge, you might find us, the Fandalorians, teachers by day, nerds by night. My name is Mr. Richardson, and by day, Mr. McDonald, Mr. G, and I teach and inspire America's youth. But by night, we debate, discuss, and argue about all things in the pop culture universe on our podcast. We discuss all the biggest pop culture topics in the world, like Ozark, Stranger Things, The Marvelous Miss Maisel, Marvel, Star Wars, Top Gun Maverick, The Old Man, Bridgerton. You name it, we'll probably discuss it. You guys watch Bridgerton? Yo, season one of Bridgerton was awesome. You don't know what you're missing. Since we are teachers, you will always get a ton of background information about our topics and original teacher-themed segments, like our pop culture morning announcements, building meetings, and post-observation reviews of shows and movies. Oh, and arguing. You'll get lots of disagreements in arguing, like way more than I'm comfortable with. You can find us wherever you listen to your podcasts. Just search for The Fandalorians, Teachers by Day, Nerds by Night. Then join us every Monday as we look into the current state of fandom and pop culture. Hey, look, the bell's about to ring. We need to head to the buses. Hopefully, we'll see you guys soon. Well, I mean, they're not going to see us because this is a podcast. I, I know. I know. I... But they can't even see us when you think about it. So they won't see us either. Oh, my God. You know what I meant. It wasn't literal. Just ring the bell. Ring the bell. The Fandalorians, teachers by day, nerds by night. I hope you listen and subscribe to us soon. I hate you guys. We are. <laughs> Sorry. You're going to give us a, a little musical montage for uh, our main segment? That's right. That was. Uh, that. Yeah, it's like funny. It's like. I, I was going through this last night, and I was, I was I was putting together the outline, and I was like, I feel like we did a lot of this already, but we also just did an episode on Danny Elfman. Danny so Elfman, oh, and it's, yeah, there's yeah. a lot of like crossover. <laughs> and the the Beetlejuice theme is so highly used at Halloween time because it's such a Halloweeny kind of song, and you it's know? very very similar. At least like the opening few opening bars of it are very similar to Men in Black. Yeah. And you listen to the Men in Black theme was very, very similar. And that is not a Tim Burton film. Timothy Walter Burton was born in Burbank, California. <laughs> Spent most of his childhood as a recluse. That's no. Shocking. I know. <laughs> wow. Drawing cartoons and watching old movies. He was especially fond of films starring Vincent Price. You know, which would come uh, full circle when he brings Vincent Price into mm -hmm. Edward Scissorhands. Uh, when he was in the ninth grade, his artistic talent was recognized by a local garbage company when he won a prize for an anti-litter poster that he designed. The company placed the poster on all the garbage trucks for a year. After graduating from high school, he attended the California Institute of Arts. And like so many others who graduated from that school, Burton's first job was as an animator for Disney. I like that he went uh, to the CIA. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
So he uh, his early career had a uh, you know he was a uh, he worked on the Fox and the Hound, Black Cauldron. A lot of that was like background work as an animator and mm-hmm. such. Uh, and it was weird because I'm looking I was looking at like some of his early career when I was doing the filmography section of this and a lot of short films early in his career as a director and a writer. A lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of short films. And it wasn't really until uh, somebody decided, hey, let's give this weirdo. <laughs> let's give this weird guy uh uh the directing credit for uh uh peewee's big adventure <laughs> that he then you know he then kind of took off as a director so let's bring up his filmography should mention he was briefly married to uh helena bottom carter his 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 uh often muse in his films before he replaced her with Johnny Depp as his muse. Hmm. So he uses both of them as his muse. Well, they were both, yeah. I think, yeah. yeah. So his career started in 1971 as uh, a short film director. He released a, a number of short films uh, between 71 and 79, it looks like. Houdini, The Untold Story, The Island of Dr. Agor, Prehistoric Cavemen, Tim's Dreams, 1997, King and Octopus Animation, The Doctor of Doom, Stalk of the Celery Monster. I think a lot of these were done when he was like in college. Uh, these sound like college films. Then he directed a short film in 82, another one called Vincent in 1982. And then he had a TV movie that he directed in 1983, Hansel and Gretel. I feel like I might have seen this. I don't know. Vincent Price hosted it. <laughs> Disney uh, Channel. This is a Tim Burton Disney Channel Halloween film short. So. Yes, it is. It's a only aired Rental, once. A live action and stop motion animated film featuring East Asian actors and striking set designs reminiscent of his later work in Beetlejuice and Edward Scissorhands. Uh, while the film was created during his employment at Disney Feature Films, his stop motion work began with the short film Vincent and continues this day with some of his other films. Uh, he also did some 2D animation work with Disney with The Fox and the Hound and The Black Cauldron. The Black Cauldron makes sense. The Fox and the Hound doesn't. <laughs> yeah, I don't get The Fox and the Hound. Yeah. In 1984, he directed a short film called Frank and Weenie, uh, which he would then the recreate short. later on into a full length film. Yep. First major film as a director, 1985, Pee-wee's Big Adventure. Let's take a moment to talk about this one, friends. <laughs> Look, who doesn't understand the concept of a boy's love of his bike and his need to travel <laughs> halfway across the country to make sure he gets it back? Uh, I recently... It's not from when the boy's a grown-ass man. <laughs> <laughs> I recently, <laughs> in in my STEM class recently, I had my my students trying to build a Rube Goldberg machine, and so oh, I was I was showing them examples of it from some movies like The Goonies and such. And so I showed them the machine he uses at the beginning of Pee Wee's Big Adventure to make his breakfast, and it's like it makes this giant breakfast with eggs and bacon and pancakes, and then he has the Mr. T cereal poured on top. And then he sits down with a giant fork and he eats one bite of it and walks away. And they were so angry <laughs> <laughs> that he made this giant breakfast and didn't eat it. It was hilarious. <laughs> and I remember watching that movie for the first time when I was, it was 1985. I would have been uh, eight years old. And I remember watching it going, God damn it. He didn't eat the whole breakfast, man. <laughs> Never waste a breakfast like that. Uh, I I hated this movie when I was a kid because my sisters watched this on like a loop, and and it tortured me. Um, well, but then in, Marge like, tortured you. Yeah. Well, then in like yeah, but, uh, yeah. If you talk about the jump scare episode, <laughs> uh, but then in in later years when I rewatched it again as an adult, I found a lot of humor in it that I was like, well, that's definitely not kids' humor. <laughs> no. <laughs> there was definitely some adult jokes in there. I and I actually found it kind of funny later on when I rewatched it. Uh. He would then go on to direct one episode of Alfred Hitchcock Presents in 1986. Yeah, but, hold on, Lee. Just yes. for a second. Just notice. They give us big break in 85, and they don't give him another break for three more years. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> so yeah, he made a lot of money with the Pee Wee's Big Adventure. That movie did did surprisingly well at the box office. Uh, and then he kind of like floundered a little bit. Did a couple of TV directing things with Fairy Tale Theater now for Hitchcock Presents. And then in 1988, um, he wrote the screenplay for Beetlejuice, and they brought him on as the director for it. It was kind of like a, it was almost like a like a trust fall project. Like let's see what he can do with this. Mm-hmm. And the movie made a fucking shit ton of money. <laughs> I would and argue this is like, this is the movie that made him. It is the movie that made him. It's definitely the movie. Mm-hmm. Like, Pee Wee's Big Adventure was the movie that kind of introduced him to Hollywood as somebody who could be a director and not just an animator. But Beetlejuice is the movie that made him as everything. Like he's a, a mm-hmm. writer on the film, a director on the film. Uh, you know, he had a lot to do with the animation behind the scenes. Uh, and it is a great film. It's, it's one of my favorite comedies. One of my favorite Tim Burton films. Uh, spirit of the deceased couple are harassed by an unbearable family that has moved into their home and they hire a malicious spirit to drive them out. It's a uh, classic performance from Michael Keaton. Uh, the stars in the movie are actually Alec Baldwin and Gina Davis. Yeah, even, though, e- even though Beetlejuice gets all the credit. Uh, Beetlejuice uh, only appears in the movie for I, I forgot what it was, but I think it's like less than 20 minutes total screen time. Mm. Right in a two-hour film, um, but you forget about that when he gets on the screen because he just eats up the scenery so much that you know you forget that he's hardly in the film at all. Right. They also spell the name of the movie phonetically because uh, it was supposed to be spelled uh, Beetle like spelling, yeah, like the spelling of the of the right. constellation. But the studio was afraid people wouldn't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> it's like the Oneiders. So yeah, like the Oneaters, yeah. <laughs> the Oneaters. The Oneaters. Whoa, wonders. So it's it's uh it's spelled um phonetically so people would understand it. I mean it's a great cast. Catherine O'Hara, mm-hmm. Gina Davis, Alec Bowen, Michael Keaton, Winona Ryder in one of her like early, early roles. Uh a man I hate mentioning often, Jeffrey Jones, because of things that he did in his personal life. But he's great in it. I mean, it's 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 it's, it's such a fun. It's so fucking weird, <laughs> but in a good way. <laughs> and it's got some great quotes in it too. Um, one of my favorite is when uh, he's he's shrunk down and he's standing on top of the model and he's screaming at them because they they disappeared. They wouldn't hire him or whatever. And he kicks right. the tree and it falls over and he's like, "Nice fucking Fuck model." No. <laughs> uh-huh. Or when the when the strip club shows up. <laughs> <laughs> Did you put that in there? No. <laughs> Look, we shot the same uh, story. <laughs> I can't remember the line. It's it's Jeffrey Jones is he brings um was it Dick Cavett and yeah. and uh, what's his name up to try to sell him on the on the real estate in this little town, and he's like we hired so and so you know he's the guy that created the talking Marcel Marceau statue. <laughs> 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 it's such like a throwaway line, uh, but yeah, I love this movie. It's one of my favorites. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. Home, home, home. Do you ever notice? Bandworms, am I right? In the one scene where they're meeting with their uh, their afterlife consultant, <laughs> there's like a group of ghosts in the window behind them, like kind of sitting mm-hmm. there. Watch. They are set up to look like an audience in a movie theater. So, like while you're watching the movie, the dead people are watching like a movie in which you are in the film as well. <laughs> so it's like a a mirror movie watching experience. Quirky little things like that that made him such a unique director. It was because of the success of Beetlejuice that he went on a string of friggin' hits, including a a movie that was like gifted to him. Like it's it's still bizarre that he was given this movie to direct, but when you know when you watch it, you can see it's a Tim Burton film. But it was like, all right, he made a lot of money with Beetlejuice. Who are we going to get to direct this blockbuster comic book mm-hmm. film? That we invested all this money in. Let's give it to the weird guy who used to animate for Disney. <laughs> oh, you and, know, the Batman in that movie already worked with him once. So Yeah, so you have Michael Keaton as the Batman, which was already mm-hmm. kind of a controversial uh Because he was uh, only casting. doing comedies at that point. He hadn't done comedies, that serious roles. Occasional like drama, but mostly yeah, mostly comedies. Mostly comedies. And, and comedies where he was sort of like an over the top personality as well. 
Yeah. And like when you play Batman, Mom. you have to kind of be a little Batman little is Mr. Mom. Mr. Mom is yeah. Batman. Mr. Mom. I mean, the over the top performance, of course, in this film. Is Jack, <laughs> Jack Nicholson. <laughs> You ever dance with the devil in the pale moonlight? What is that? That of all my prey. It's like the sound. <laughs> How do I get those wonderful toys? <laughs> <laughs> I love the scene at the end where Batman comes flying in in the in the in the plane thing, the bat plane, and he's like, "Why did somebody tell me he had one of those <laughs> things? <laughs> <Good> things? <laughs> he stole my balloons." <laughs> Where's Bob the Batman? Dunn. He's at home watching his tights. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I think the best line in that film is when uh, the Joker is dancing with Vicky Vale on the top of the cathedral, and he's like, "It's mm-hmm. like Beauty and the Beast, except if anybody else calls you Beast, I'll rip their heart out." <laughs> <laughs> he did. I mean, Tim Burton did an amazing job of bringing the 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 black back to the back, you know, making it dark, it, washing it's... away the uh, camp of. Uh, of uh you like, know like um, he West. he took the he took the idea of of gotham and mm-hmm. and really went with the gotham is gothic portion of it yeah <laughs> like it it is a dark damp depressing city mm-hmm. <laughs> that only tim burton could could figure could could create and and yeah and he he brought out uh a quirkiness to it that was it's it does have like a quirkiness kind of like the adam west batman but it, but and there's enough dark and brooding and other stuff going on that it doesn't seem like a campy version of the Batman TV show. Right. Uh, then he has 1990 Edward Scissorhands. This I think this, kinda... was, this was his pet project, wasn't it? This was something he yeah, based on this his is, drawings. This is, this is kind of like the point now, like with the success of Beetlejuice and Batman that he's kind of given carte blanche now. Like, mm-hmm. what do you want to make next? I'm going to make this movie about a man with hands for, with scissors for hands. And it's like, um, what the fuck? All right. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> they went, they went. What? Yeah, Somebody here's went, 30, what here's $30 million. Go for it. And well, it, got, it got nominated for, you know, best makeup. <laughs> yeah, it did. Uh, it was the first collaboration uh, between he and Johnny Depp. Mm-hmm. And so you have this weird combo now because you have Tim Burton directing. He wrote the script. He brought in an actor who at the time was best known for 21 Jump Street uh, into this role that requires him to be almost silent throughout the entire film and and awkward and quirky, but also sort of attractive in a very goth way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he brought emo to emo. He brought emo uh, to emo. You know, I mean, he, he, who else? And who else to be attracted to to that than one night a rider? And one night a rider. And uh, honestly, and and maybe I'm weird, but this is the movie that I found oh, yeah. the rider the most attractive in. <laughs> I don't know if it has to do yeah. with the blonde yeah. hair or something, but yeah. <laughs> um, it's also the final film appearance of Vincent Price. Hmm. He died very shortly after the movie. I don't even think he he lived to see the movie premiere. Um, he died like shortly after the filming of it, of it, and he was Tim Burton, one of Tim Burton's heroes in Hollywood, mm-hmm. and he finally got a chance to work with him. And thankfully, it was you know you know while he was still you know able to. Uh, some, I love Diana Weist in the movie as Winona Ryder's mom. Yeah, she's hilarious. And uh, um, Alan, is it Alan Alda? Not Alan Alda. Why am I thinking Alan? Uh, who the dad? Yeah, it's, uh, Alan Arkin. Alan Arkin. Yeah, Alan Arkin is the uh, yeah. You have Anthony Michael Hall from Breakfast Club is the bully who's dating mm-hmm. uh, Winona Ryder. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's uh, it's it's a good movie, man. It's I remember when I watched it for the first time, thinking I don't know what I feel like, what I feel, how I feel about this. And then after like a, a rewatch, I was like, yeah, this is actually a a, a very thoughtful film. From and, there, um, that actually, I mean, and where I know we're not focusing back on Danny Elfman, but that also has one of those iconic scores that you hear it's more of a Christmassy, you know, mm-hmm. carol. Anyway. I think his first collaboration with Danny Elfman was on the Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Um mm-hmm. and then he brought him back for Beetlejuice and then he kind of became his go to because he does Batman with him, Edward Scissorhands, yeah. Batman Returns in nineteen ninety two. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, a slew of these other movies that he's, that he's done along the way. Right. Uh, in 1992, he does Batman Returns, another major hit. Mm -hmm. Able the, to bring back Michael the, he Keaton. Got, yep. Go ahead. Go ahead. Here you go, Chad. No, I was just going to say that, I mean, he brings back Michael Keaton. He brings in Danny DeVito and Michelle Pfeiffer. And uh, I'd say this is just as good as 89 Batman, but then he gets a lot of slack. Um, and I just saw a, a short video clip of this as well because of how dark it is, because Michelle Pfeiffer's Catwoman is too attractive, you know, and and the uh, tipper quarters of everybody. Oh, what about the children? You know. Um, you don't want that. You don't want Catwoman to be too attractive. Don't hire Michelle Pfeiffer. Yeah. I'm or Anne violent. Hathaway. Too or violent. Anne Hathaway. So, yeah. <laughs> like, but it's Batman. Or, yes, it's or, Batman. But let's face the fact: like, it's not. You're not. I mean, yes, kids may view this, but older people are going to view this too, and that's who. That's who really enjoyed it. Can but. we? Can we take? Can we take an assessment of this? You did too attractive. The original Catwoman was Julie Newmar. Mm -hmm. yeah, who, hot attractive. as bulls. Uh, Eartha Kitt, pretty attractive. Very attractive. Uh, uh, Lee Merriweather, very attractive. Mm -hmm. Michelle Pfeiffer. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. Who, who else yeah, we have? Yeah. Uh, Halle, yeah. Berry, Halle Berry was in a very awful adaptation of Catwoman, but still, it's Halle so Berry. Attractive. Uh, Anne Hathaway looked extremely amazing. attractive. Yes, best on the bike. And, and Zoe, 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 Zoe Kravitz, the latest Catwoman, <laughs> very attractive. All remarkable. It, it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a trend. It goes with the character, <laughs> and it goes with the character. Uh, Batman Returns. Uh, I I like Batman Returns, and it's funny. Like uh, the character that Christopher Walken plays in it was not supposed to be in the film. Uh, it was supposed to be Two Face. Uh, oh yeah. Harvey Harvey Dent was originally played by uh, Billy D. Williams. Yeah. And right. there was uh, there was like kickback from the studio or something. Like they didn't want to bring him back or something. I don't I don't remember the whole story of it, but they ended up writing the character out and creating the the uh, character that Walken plays in the film. Mm -hmm. That scene at the end where he gets electrocuted and and killed was originally supposed to be the scene where Two Face is created. Oh, really? Yeah. How about that? Uh, Ed Wood, 1994, the only film in his career that he received an Oscar nomination for. Hmm. Uh, actually, he didn't. I'm looking at it now. Academy Awards. It won Best Supporting Actor for Martin Landau and Best Makeup. But that was the only nominations that it got. Yeah, so he still hasn't got nominated. He still has not got nominated himself, which is a travesty. He should have been nominated at least for Ed Wood. Or for Big Fish. Big Fish. Ed Wood is, mm -hmm. is I love Ed Wood. It's, it's a great movie. Mm -hmm. Another quirky Johnny Depp performance. Uh, Martin Landau is amazing in it as Bella Lugosi. Uh, he brings back Jeffrey Jones for this one. You got Bill Murray in it in a, in a, in a sort of a, a side character role. Vincent D'Onofrio plays Orson Welles in a cameo scene. And it's mm -hmm. amazing. <laughs> uh and just, just a lot of like like um character actors that you, you see around around Hollywood playing all these different roles in the film. Story about arguably the worst director in the history of Hollywood. Uh directed by one of the quirkiest directors in the history of Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And so what you end up with is a very quirky biog biography of who, of a man who was already very eccentric. Uh if you've never seen Ed Wood, you should see Ed Wood. He then does a directs a video called A Visit with Vincent. I don't know what this oh. is. Um, um it looks like a short film. About in the time he spends with Vincent Price. About the time he spends with Vincent Price, yeah. Yep. I'll have to find that. That looks like it'd probably be really interesting. Mm. I would love to I would love to find that. I wonder if that's on like YouTube or something. Uh it says it's a short documentary. An hour long. Okay. I'll have to Do see you if I can tell find you it. on here where you where you can find it. A visit with Vincent. Uh nineteen ninety six. He directs a film that I really like, but did not do that well. No, considering the, the cast, I mean, yeah, and everybody. Mars Attacks. Uh, it's his homage to like the 1950s, like B movie yeah. alien invasion films. 
Uh, I think it was just a little too quirky for some people. So he directed. The aliens were a little too quirky. In I, I, I love the. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> <laughs> you have Jack Nicholson, who plays, I think, three or four different roles in the film, uh-huh. including the president. Uh, Pierce Brosnan, Annette Benning, Sarah Jessica Parker, Glenn Close, Danny DeVito, Michael J. Fox, Martin Short, Rod Steiger, Tom Jones, Natalie Portman, Lucas Haas, Jim Brown, Paul Winfield, Pam Greer, and Jack Black. Like, come on, man. <laughs> and Lisa Marie. Lisa Marie. And she was in uh, Ed Wood as well. It's, no, she, it, she became the Martian yeah. girl. Lisa she Marie becomes... is the... A, sta- a staple in his for a while while they were together. Mm-hmm. You know, so he was, she was um, the Martian, the girl that the Martians, you know, dress up and pretend to be the mm-hmm. human woman. Uh, I, I I think it's a great movie. It's very quirky, uh, weird sense of humor. And I love that the aliens are defeated. So it's like kind of like a spoof of the fact that the aliens and World of Worlds are defeated by, by germs, mm-hmm. you know, right. uh, Human bacteria that the uh, aliens in this film are defeat are defeated by Hank Williams. <laughs> just listening, just listening, just, yeah, just listening to Hank Williams makes their heads explode. <laughs> Spoiler alert! Spoiler. Then he does Sleepy Hollow in 1999. A hot take: I'm not a big fan of this one. Really? I um I like it. It's a it's a Halloween movie for me. I enjoy it. Wow, well, I, did, I didn't hate it. I, I, I mean, he made a very good. He he took a short story and mm-hmm. made it into a interesting, um, you know, horror mystery. I think my biggest complaint with a lot of movies is that they're too long sometimes, and I feel like this was a little too long considering you're basing it on a short story. Right. Um, I thought Johnny Depp was great in it as usual. I thought mm-hmm. uh, Christina Ricci was great in it. Um, there's a lot of story behind the scenes about how uncomfortable they were playing like love interests because he was like 20 years older than her. Uh, Chris Walken is Chris Walken. I'm never going to fucking mm-hmm. complain about Chris Walken. <laughs> Casting him as the headless horseman and not having him talk at all. <laughs> Right, and uh, I'm actually, kind of we talked about <laughs> limited screen time. Mm-hmm. He, doesn't, he doesn't have much. It's flashbacks, and and you know, the end of the movie is essentially what you see of him. Ray Parks did all of the, uh, the horseman work without mm-hmm. the head. You know, I would say I do like that portion of it. Like when when the horseman shows up and is like decapitating people, like that. Mm-hmm. Most of that's done pretty well. Very creepy and atmospheric. Uh. A lot more creepy and atmospheric than uh, House of a Thousand Corpses. <laughs> uh, I'm going to stop here to mention that we are going to be uh, recording a special guest spot on the All Hallows Eve podcast this Saturday coming up. On Monday, we're going to have two episodes featuring your favorite films and fermentation people. Our 99th episode that we're recording now about Tim Burton, but we were also going to have our special guest spot episode on All Hallows Eve uh, uh, dropping on Monday as well. Where we are going to be reviewing the Rob Zombie directorial debut, debut, House of a Thousand Corpses. Spoiler alert, I hate this fucking movie. (laughs) And you will hear all about it on the All Hallows Eve podcast. Back to Tim Burton. Fun fact about Sleepy Hollow. Mm -hmm. Um, There are three Sith actors in this. (laughs) <laughs> so you got you got uh ray park who was darth ray maul. park who was darth maul uh christopher lee christopher, christopher lee. lee who was dooku right and three sith are in it i'm gonna say without looking at the cast uh oh. ian, ian mcdermott who played uh palpatine is he in oh no i'm sorry it's jeffrey jones jeffrey jones was the third sith I'm just messing with you. No, it's Ian Lord, McDermott. You know? <laughs> I was, was going to say, Jeffrey Jones is not a Sith Lord. He I was, was just commenting for... on how evil he was. You yeah, know? He was arrested for child pornography. That's worse. <laughs> I'd rather be a Sith Lord. Uh, but yeah, Ian McDermott, who played uh, Palpatine. Yes, Palpatine. Uh, that leads to a two-year break when he comes back in 2001 with the much-anticipated reboot of the 
uh, classic sci-fi film, Planet of the Apes. God, did this movie blow. <laughs> hey, Abe, what you doing? How's your mother? How's your mother? <laughs> it's a planet full of apes. It's, it's How a did planet this full of apes. Why they're, are you, they're throwing are you so the poo. Ape? They're throwing the poo. Why are you throwing your poo at me, Ape? They're so angry. Why are you so angry, Apes? In 2029, an Air Force astronaut crash lands on a mysterious planet where evolved talking apes dominate a race of primitive humans. Gentlemen, the floor is yours. <laughs> Let me just say, Mark Wahlberg. Mark Wahlberg had his best. Actually, no, I will. I am going to get. I, I got to find some some small degree of like good in this and the only thing i'm going to say i'm going to go back to certain actors so david warner uh being awesome michael clark duncan being duncan. awesome That's almost, yeah michael clark tim, duncan was yeah, awesome. tim roth about it. as Thade, awesome um actually, paul giamatti actors, paul giamatti, paul was, giamatti awesome. was awesome i love yeah. the makeup and the costume he wears mm -hmm. is perfect and he so kills it yeah i would say yeah. like all the actors that they got to play the apes Apes. Yes, we're Very awesome. Good. I like the fact that they made them more ape-like. Like they walked like apes, and they would jump around from like tree to tree and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Like they weren't as human as like the. But you guys think you know, with the original film, there's like limitations to what they could have done. But like that portion of it, I really liked. Mark Wahlberg was definitely a weak link. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, um, story was a you know just. Stella Warren as the female interest in the film, a weak link because she's a model, she's not an actress. You know, I she don't know tried. why she why really, they can, really why tried. they try to do that stuff. Um, yeah, it was mostly like the 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 actors playing humans mm -hmm. <laughs> were the weak link in this film. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the makeup in this movie is is incredible. Uh, mm -hmm. It 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 I think it did it get an Oscar or at least got a nomination or something for the makeup in the film. Michael Clark Duncan is oh. looks phenomenal in the film, yeah, and and has the presence to like to like you know kind of embody this silverback gorilla persona that he's playing, mm -hmm. and and Tim Tim Roth looked like he was having a lot of fun. Yeah, <laughs> he came like, off super creepy. Oh yeah, he, like, you know? like like he even managed to make like this mask that he was wearing have the facial expressions he needs like it was like mm -hmm. the performances of the characters playing the apes yeah. i i enjoyed i like telling about a carter too uh in her character kind of being like a, a throwback to the female ape scientist from the original film uh you know like she was pretty good creepy scene with her kissing mark Wahlberg though <laughs> they do that in the original film but for some reason it was less creepy back then <laughs> apes don't have lips but can we talk about the real reason that this movie didn't work? The ending? Um, the fucking twist ending. <laughs> <laughs> with, with Shade as the Lincoln Memorial. In Apes We Trust. Zero sense. <laughs> <laughs> like, there was zero sense in that film. Uh, 2000 to 2001, he does six episodes of a TV miniseries called The World of Stain Boy. Which I remember talking about this in the Danny Elfman episode because I'd never heard of this before. Local superhero Stain Boy hunts down oddball villains harnessing bizarre powers. It's a little animated series uh, that he did six episodes of. Back to his roots. Yeah. Animation. And it seems very strange. It's uh, Each episode was only five minutes long. It was definitely a very short animation. It took him uh, a year to do six? <laughs> yeah. Then in, uh, I mean, animation takes a long time, especially hand-drawn animation like that is. Mm. Uh, 2003, he comes back with his uh, next uh, big feature. I love this movie. Yeah. I, I really, really love this movie. Did not do well at the box office. We're, we're reaching a point now where Tim Burton becomes sort of hit or miss, and a lot of it has to do with, with how big a miss the Planet of the Apes was. Mm -hmm. um, so Big Fish comes out in 2003. Great movie, very fun. Nominated for one Oscar, best uh, uh, music by Danny Elfman. Um, story of a man who tells a lot of tall tales. 
and the son who was frustrated in trying to determine the fact from the fiction in his you know father's life story uh, I like movies like this though, where it's like connecting, where sons connect with fathers. I don't know what mm-hmm. it is, but I get a kick out of these movies. Yeah, they got Ewan McGregor as Ed Bloom and Albert Finney as the older version of Ed Bloom. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Uh, Billy Crudup as the son, Will Jessica Lang as his wife, uh, Allison Lohman as uh, the, young the young version, version. of Jessica Lang's character. Helena Bottom Carter plays two roles in the film. Uh, Jenny and the witch that shows you how you're going to die mm-hmm. final film appearance of robert guillaume playing the doctor uh one of my favorite actresses marion cotillard as as Billy credup's wife josephine matthew mcgrory as carl the giant uh i would like to point out that matthew mcgrory carl the giant was also in house of a thousand corpses he was <laughs> tiny Oh, uh, Tiny? The character Tiny yeah. is played by Matthew oh, oh, that was the name of the character. I thought it was yeah. before his, his growth spurt. Yeah, his name. the character's name was Tiny. Uh, Missy Pyle, uh, Danny DeVito, Steve Buscemi, Deep Roy. Like, these are it's another, like, stack cast movie. It's got a, a great story, uh, great visuals. I love the 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 tall tales that he tells and, and you know, how they create the visuals for them. But then I love how, like, when you see the characters at the end, you you come to find out that these were all real people. They were just versions of them that he created. You know, like like you know, even though the versions were were overblown and, and exaggerated, they were still real people. And and uh, I don't, I can't say enough about this movie. I wish it I wish it had a bigger following and and did better in the box office. And then we jump right back into the fucking realm of the weird. <laughs> 2005 Charlie and the Chocolate Factory um, well book accurate Johnny Depp was very creepy in that movie <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 he was, it was closer to the book than, than you know Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory but yeah. it was <laughs> it was a Tim Burton you know Tim, it was a Tim Burton production, which means it's just going to be weird. It was Johnny Depp doing some weird, like Michael Jackson version of Willy Wonka, mm-hmm. uh, which made it more creepy. Which made it creepy. At least, like Gene Wilder's like creepy version was more like, "Oh, this man's psychotic, and he's going to kill these children." <laughs> Whereas the Willy Wonka that that Johnny Depp brought us, I was afraid he was going to molest the kids at some point during the film. Uh. uh I'm trying to think of things I liked about this movie. Deep Roy. Deep Roy was Deep Roy. awesome. Deep Roy was awesome <laughs> as the Oompa Loompas. Yeah. Uh, I did like that you get to see the kids at the end, like what they look like yes. after they're pulled out of the traps that they mm-hmm. fell into. Because <laughs> uh, the original, the original film with, with, with Gene Wilder, I was always like frightened by it because you, you never know, find out what happens to the kids. Uh, and then in 2005, he goes back to his animated roots. And gives us the Corpse Bride. Notice I did not include Tim Burton's Nightmare Before Christmas in this. Because he didn't direct, he produced. He did not direct it, he produced it. Right. But he gets all the credit for it, and people think that you know no. he was the director and all, but he really wasn't. No, but he, he was the the source, you know, like it was his story. He had been mm-hmm. working on that for a while, so he does deserve most of the uh, credit. So like if I do producer credits and I look it up, um, so it is. He was also producer on James and the Giant Peach. Mm, yeah, well, he was also producer on Batman Forever. We're not holding that against him. <laughs> so oh, uh, the director of Nightmare Before Christmas was Henry Selick, but Tim Burton wrote and produced the film. Um, so, like, if you're wondering why I didn't bring it up in the meantime, it was because I was mainly focusing on his filmography as a director. So let's take a time. <laughs> Uh, so as a director in animated films, he brings us The Corpse Bride in 2005. Yeah. And then Nine in 2009. I think I'm looking at his producer credits again. Hold on. That was a producer, yep. That was a producer yep. credit. Yeah, yeah that was an animated. I'm redo my thing here. Uh, but, uh, that being said, nine, nine was actually a very interesting story, too. I really enjoyed Nine. Yeah, it was a very weird movie. <clears throat> Yeah. Uh, so yeah. getting back to director credits, he did directed Corpse Bride. Then he went back to short films for a little bit. 
the Cinema 16. Her music videos. Films. He did a music video for The Killers. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then comes back in 2007. I would say he came back pretty strong with Sweeney Todd. Yeah. Uh, it, was, a, it, uh, it was a bigger a hit than, than I think most people expected. Yeah, it, it was a musical. Play. It was in uh, San, Sondheim. Sondheim, am I saying mm-hmm. that right? Stephen Sondheim, yeah. Steven Sondheim uh, musical that they, you know, put into a movie. Uh, really well done. Uh, didn't know Johnny Depp could sing. Mm-hmm. Um, I enjoyed his performance. I enjoyed Hell of the Bottom Carter's performance in it. Mm-hmm. I liked Alan Rickman in it. Alan Rickman <laughs> was really good Alan in Rickman it. Alan Rickman was great in it. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I always loved Alan Rickman anyway. But this, Sasha uh, Baron Cohen. I Johnny Depp had a, 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 a Oscar nom. You got an for Oscar that. nomination for it, yeah. yeah. It was. Uh, it's weird because it's like this. Is, like I said before, this is the point in his career where like it's like hit, miss, hit, miss, hit, yep. miss. Mm-hmm. So like he has a hit with Sweeney Todd, and then in 2010, Alice in Wonderland comes out, and that was a big miss. Uh, was I it? Don't know, I don't know what to say about this movie. I don't know. I think was- Alice in Wonderland had a bit of a hit it was it was a soft hit but it was a hit i mean it, was it did through I disney it did well, so disney kind of promoted well the, the shit office. out of it yeah it kind of did well in the box you know like was not very well received no and it's just like they just went too weird on it yeah I did enjoy like, it, is Alice in, it is Alice in Wonder. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the whole fucking yeah, movie like, and Elsie and Alice head. Egypt anyway. <laughs> the big ass head. On Helen and Bottom Carter. I did, enjoy, I did enjoy Crispin Glover as the Knave of Hearts. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, and Matt Lucas as Tweedledee and Tweedledum. Uh-huh. <laughs> and of course, Alan Rickman. Of course. Uh, but the rest of the movie was just, it was so weird. I heard somebody talking. I heard somebody talking about this on a podcast recently, and I can't remember what they said, but it, it made me laugh. They were like, "This is a movie about a young girl being forced into marriage to a man that she doesn't love, and then she unfortunately ends up in another movie where she's in Wonderland, <laughs> <laughs> or as they call it in, in the movie Underland." <laughs> Uh, God, it was like a, another weird Depp performance where Depp is, he, Depp's reached a point in his career, I think now, where he's either Jack Sparrow or some version of Willy Wonka. <laughs> <laughs> and the man well, had a weird we're, version we're of Willy Wonka. We're about to go into another movie by uh, Tim Burton where he's neither of those two. He's just weird. <laughs> he's a dark shadow. I, I didn't hate Johnny Depp as the Mad Hatter. You didn't hate him? I didn't hate it. I no. love him. <laughs> uh, no, I thought he was all right as a Mad Hatter. He was quite mad. Um, 2012, he comes out with Dark Shadows. Oof. Uh, now, Oof. this movie is a loose adaptation of a TV series that was very popular in the 60s and 70s. I know this because it was my dad's favorite TV show. He used to run home from school to watch it. Oh, yeah. it, it was like a dark soap opera about yeah. a vampire named Barb yeah. Collins. And it was a horror. It wasn't a comedy like this is supposedly supposed to be. This is a dark uh. fantasy comedy. Uh, it was rebooted in the 90s as a TV sh- show as well. Uh, and then this is a third reboot, basically, but made to be sort of like this quirky comedy that just didn't work for me. Hmm. Uh, Can I say uh, one more time on this movie. Yeah. Uh, 2012, uh, he comes back with Frank and Weenie. This is the full the full length feature. The Clay Nation or the again. stop motion. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> does another Killers video here uh, here with me in 2012. Mm-hmm. 2014 directs a movie called Big Eyes. Uh, I have not seen this film. And by all accounts, I don't really need to see this film from what I've heard about it. <laughs> Uh, stars Naomi Watts and uh, or Amy Adams. I'm sorry, Amy Adams and Christoph Waltz. Yes, Amy Christoph Adams Waltz. plays uh, a painter named Margaret Keane, who became very successful in the 50s after painting these pictures of children with giant eyes. Um, but due to some legal difficulty she's had with her husband, the husband claims all the credit for the work. So he claims he's the painter, even though she's the one making the portraits. Uh, that's about all I know about the film because I haven't seen it. 
Well, that's more than I know about it. Yeah. Now. 2016, uh, he does a film based on the novel Mrs. Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children. Very good novel. Uh, another one in a series of like young adult novels in, in, mm -hmm. in the vein of like Harry Potter and the Maze Runner and things like that. Not a great adaptation. No. no, this is where he's traded in for his third uh interest, I think, in Eva Green. <laughs> he went from um Marie, Pre what was her name, Lisa Marie, to mm -hmm. Helena Bonham Carter to the Eva Green. Eva Green, <laughs> they all share the same quality, you can see it across the board. Yeah. A, a sort of alluringly dark beauty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, then he does Dumbo in 2019. I have not I, seen this. I did, and I yeah. uh, I was okay with it. I was good with it. I, I enjoyed it. it I enjoyed. I did enjoy it. I'll, I'll have to. I have to check it out at some point. I have not got a chance to see it to see it. Um, I've heard like mixed things about it. Well, it's got his first muse back in it, so mm -hmm. and he got a, a lot of the reviews come from like everybody's so tied with the Disney the original animated, version. right? And then it's like, well, I'm going to have to compare it to that. You can't. You can't compare. You it can't. To that. You <laughs> can't hold those standards because nothing, nothing that comes afterward will you could will you find any any kind of pleasure in? Uh, you know, except for Lion King because it was exactly the same damn movie. Right, exactly, exactly. You know, I mean, you can I, I, if you if you kind of separate it a little bit. You know, mm. uh, the Jungle Book was good. You know, um, by comparison, is it going to be as good as the original animated? Eh, it's not what you originally saw, but I like that one a lot. Same thing with Dumbo. I thought Dumbo, it took the story, um, it added things that weren't obviously in the animated one. It, Took things out, uh, pink elephants, and um, <laughs> the black crows. The black crows, yeah. The black crows. The black oh, crows. The, the musicians, sing, uh, the the musicians were not song. involved in the song in the movie. And then he makes a surging comeback this year with the Netflix series Wednesday. Mm -hmm. In which he is the producer, one of the writers, and a director of four of the eight episodes of the show. Phenomenal show. It's Phenomenal so show. Uh, a fucking star in the making in Jenna Ortega as Wednesday. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, some great casting all around. I wasn't too sold on Catherine Zeta Jones as Morticia. I felt she was a little she was a little dry. Um, yeah. I thought the kid that played Pugsley was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but overall, I really like she it. was also busy doing, you know, um, some Disney stuff, Catherine Zeta Zone. So, mm -hmm. well, she's all over streaming services right now. I mean, she's she, she's not in it a lot. Like the the family is not the focus of the mo of the show. It's mostly Wednesday, right? Because she's at she's at this private school. school, and it's it's really a uh, it's a murder mystery like detective story, really, mm -hmm. and uh, and really well done and and funny. Some really funny moments in it. Some characters you really come to like, really like. Mm -hmm. uh, you mean like, like Piranhas? Enid, and the yeah. <laughs> like her friend Enid and and the boy mm -hmm. that runs the B Club that she's a part of and uh, and all that stuff. Like it's 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 it was a really really good series and I'm looking forward to. And uh, I really enjoyed that two. Christina Ricci was brought in. Oh, as she was a different awesome. character. It was as a completely great. different character, and she was great in it. Uh, I, yeah. I liked the uh, what's her name, uh, um, Brianna of Tarth. As the school yes. uh, principal. Yes, as the principal. Uh, I can't remember the actress's name. Gwendolyn Christie, as as the principal. Yeah, it was. I I really really enjoy Wednesday. It's it's something that I can't. I'm I'm looking forward to season two. I know they're they're filming it now. Mm -hmm. And then it, it's currently in production. Beetlejuice two. Um, back on the is, juice. Uh, so Michael Keaton is coming back. There is a movie poster for it now. There is. Oh. I'm looking at it on IMDb. It's kind of cool. Uh, follow up to the comedy Beetlejuice about a ghost who's recruited to help on a house. Top kit. Oh, look at this. Michael Keaton as Beetlejuice and Jenna Ortega ah. is listed, listed on the cast. Those are the only two people listed right now. Uh, nobody else has been given credit yet. I'm looking, see, music by Danny Elfman. There you go. 
he's back. So yeah, I'm 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 interested. Like I I mean I'm like part of me is like uh, another one of these sequels that's thirty years in the making. Mm-hmm. But the other part of me is like I love fucking Beetlejuice. I would love to see another Beetlejuice movie. <laughs> I'm looking at the writers to see if they've done anything good. One of them's been a producer on the uh, the movie It, uh, but it was a writer for Dark Shadows, Pride and Prejudice, and Zombies, and Lego Batman movie. And I like Batman, and I I, I even like Lego Batman movie because it was fucking hun- uh, funny as shit. But uh, David Katzenberg did It, Child's Play, and Ballers. He's, okay. uh, no, David Katzenberg is mainly a producer and director. He only has a few writing credits. Yeah, okay. uh, he's done a lot of he, he's directed a lot of things. Like I've heard his name before. Uh, uh, the other people, Seth Graham Smith. I feel like I heard his name before too. And like you said, yeah, he wrote Lego Batman. Yeah, and and it a oh. reboot of it. Okay, um, but they're bringing Michael McDowell, who did, who was a writer on the original Beetlejuice and Nightmare Before Christmas, and Thinner and Tales from the Dark Side. So this should, this could be good. Sometimes it's it's I, I worry when there's like a lot of writers, but I'm looking at it and it says that um, the early screenplay is Seth Graham Smith and David Katzenberg. Mike Vudinovich is the current screenplay, so they must have did like the spec script. And then Michael mm-hmm. McDowell and Larry Wilson are credited as the creators of the original character. Mm-hmm. So all right, I'm 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 looking forward to it. I'm curious. Uh, hey, look, I'm you... I'm all about Michael uh, Keaton coming back for reprising roles, you know, that on, he, that he uh, made on famous. certain. Yeah, like, yeah. I'm, I'm, so I'm kind of looking forward to it. I'm digging the Flash when you see the, uh, <laughs> when you see him come back as Batman. Coming back as Batman, you know. So let me give you a few little fun facts, fun trivia about uh, uh, Mr. Tim Burton. He was engaged to Lisa Marie from 1992 to 2001, his original muse, uh, before ditching her for Helena Bottom Carter. Mm-hmm. Uh, is a Bollywood fan. <laughs> Everywhere he goes, he carries a pocket-sized sketchbook and watercolor kit with him. Oh, how about that? <laughs> Usually dresses in black. No shit. Uh, was voted the 49th greatest director of all time by Entertainment Weekly, the youngest director on their list. It was a list of 50, so he just made the list. Uh, <laughs> was hired in 1997 to direct Superman, a movie that never went through. Thank God. I know we've seen the pictures of Nick Cage as Superman before. And it, looked, it looked pretty horrible. Uh, he once said he never remembers his dreams apart from five recurring dreams, one of them involving the girl he was in love with when he was a teenager and another involving his parents' bedroom. He, hmm. he would be a field day for Sigmund Freud. <laughs> 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 he made eight films with Johnny Depp, Edward Scissorhands, Ed Wood, Sleepy Hollow, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, The Corp Bride, Sweeney Todd, Alice in Wonderland, and Dark Shadows. Uh, Ranked sixth in the top 25 most intriguing people in the People magazine. Tropicans. Uh, <laughs> was working on a documentary about Vincent Price called Conversations with Vincent. After Price's death in 1993, he shelved the project and has never been completed. Well, I guess you're not seeing that anytime soon. Yeah. Well, I might be. Well, that one was called Visiting with Vincent. So maybe it's like partially the documentary he was filming was supposed to direct The Fly in 1986 with Michael Keaton in the lead role, but he backed out of the project and it was later taken over by David Cronenberg, who brought in Jeff Goldblum. That would have been an amazing horror movie to, like, review. Much better than House of a Thousand Corpses. (laughs) I'm just saying. Yeah, I'm hearing you. We haven't got to Saturday yet. That's pretty decided to just shit on the movie, guys. <laughs> the opening night of Batman the Musical was abandoned in 2005, even though he had been in conversations about it since 2002 to direct the Broadway musical version of Batman. And instead they moved on to Spider-Man Music at Night, or whatever the hell it was, Slinging <laughs> at Night. It was uh, Turn Off the Dark. Turn Off the Dark, sorry. <laughs> How did I screw that one up? Uh, Spielberg considered bringing him in to direct Gremlins, but decided against it because at the time Burton had never directed a feature-length film. Hmm. 
And then he hmm. would go on, of course, to direct Pee Wee's Big Adventure in 1985. Uh, his favorite films are Dracula A.D. 1972, The Original Wicker Man in 1973, The Ooh. Golden Voyage of Sinbad in 1973, mm -hmm. The War of the Gargantuans in 1966, and The Omega Man in 1971. I love this fun fact. He has a phobia of chimpanzees. <laughs> From the man who directed Planet of the Apes. <laughs> was... <laughs> was originally set to direct Spawn in 1997. Oh, that would have been a much better movie. I would have liked that a lot. Was considered to direct X-Men yeah. in 2000. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh... I don't know how that would have been. Originally offered the script for Drop Dead Fred in 1991, but decided against it. Oh, he was also um, attached to a series of unfortunate events in 2004. That's right. Where he would have had Johnny Depp play Count Olaf. <laughs> he has a strong dislike of cats. <laughs> <laughs> I like, I'm looking at like all these ones that he was considered to direct. It's funny. He was considered to direct Mary Shelley's Frankenstein in 1994. And mm -hmm. Kenneth Branagh one. Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Men Tell No Tales. He was offered a chance to direct Stay Tuned in 1992, which is a movie starring John Ritter. Ooh, that was a bad movie. I hated that uh, movie. It was a movie I was actually considering for movies that Time Forgot, but then like I rewatched it recently, and I was like, no, nah, fuck that. There's a, there's a reason why Time Forgot <laughs> it. He was considered um, to direct The Truman Show. No, that might have been interesting. He was going to direct Mary Riley, but chose to do Ed Wood instead. I think that was a good choice. He was going to direct The Addams Family, uh, Cabin Boy, Dick Tracy. He was considered for Jurassic Park, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. God damn, it's like he was considered for every like weird, quirky movie that mm -hmm. was ever like brought to a Hollywood producer. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, Mike, do you have any beer trivia for us this evening? I have some beer history for you. That sounds good. Maize or corn has long been used for an ancient beer style called chicha, chicha. Particularly, yeah, particularly in the Andes Mountains of South America. Its origins predate the Incan culture. Today, it is still consumed in large quantities at festivals and celebration. It is often made communally by chewing the grain and spitting it into a large pot where then it ferments. That sounds disgusting. That was disgusting. <laughs> that sounded pretty nasty. <laughs> uh, thank you. All right, so uh, uh, let's talk about our drinks then again. Uh, I'm done munching on my pumpkin. It was pretty good. <clears throat> I'm onto my punch. Yeah. My, uh, Jim Bean strawberry punch. punch. Oh, that yep. looks good too. My Kirsch uh, Noir was very good, and I have since moved on to a uh, uh, Tanner Brewing My Caramel Romance, which was 5.4%. I had this before on the show. It was very good. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. I might be uh, cracking open either another one of the pumpkins or maybe the Oktoberfest one from Devil's Backbone after this. because mm -hmm. I, I, I feel I'm getting thirsty again, and I need to uh, quench this thirst. <laughs> Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight for episode 99, The Coogie Career of Tim Burton. We hope you enjoyed listening to this podcast as much as we enjoyed recording it for you. Don't forget, you can email us at filmsandfermentation at gmail.com or visit linktree.com slash filmsandfermentation for all of our social media and podcast links. Don't forget, on Monday, March Monday, 27th, Monday, Monday, Monday. On Monday, March 27th, not only will you be getting this episode of Films and Fermentation, but you will also be able to go out and listen to the newest episode of the All Hallows Eve podcast featuring Jason and Kathy. We will be guests uh, hosting that show with them as we review the seminal classic Oscar-winning auteur, <laughs> House of a Thousand Corpses, <laughs> by the man often compared most to Steven Spielberg. Rob Zombie. Robert Zombie. Yes. Yeah, Zombie. Yes. Zombie. Ro Zombie. Is it, Zombie it's enough? French, isn't it? It's Robert Zombie. Ro Robert Zombie. <laughs> or as I like to call it, one of the worst fucking movies I have ever seen in my life. <laughs> I can't wait to shit all over this movie. <laughs> Wasn't that a scene <laughs> in the movie? I think there was a scene in the movie where somebody shit on themselves. Mm -hmm. 
I was telling Mike. I've not got to that part yet. <laughs> spoilers, boys. Spoilers. I was uh, I was telling Mike. Mike's like, it's not that scary or anything. I was like, I know. I, it's it's actually toned down. It's the, it, because the original version was NC seventeen, hmm. and there is a director's cut available where you can watch the NC seventeen version, and even that has no interest to me. No. <laughs> no. So, yeah. Jason and Kathy, we look forward to recording with you this weekend for that episode on Monday. We should have a lot of fun <laughs> talking about this movie. <laughs> Don't forget to stop by the crossroads between pickled and fermented the next time around because we are going to be recording episode 100. <laughs> <laughs> for our special 100th episode we are going to be doing a uh little bit of a look at the american film institute list of the top 100 films of all time uh doing a little little run through of that list and coming up with a uh, uh some films that we believe need to be added to the afi list at this point Jeez. um so for like house of a thousand corpses like house of a thousand oh. corpses that should be number two on the list right behind citizen king <laughs> so in a couple of weeks here you'll be joining us for episode 100 uh hopefully it's you know we record a few more after that that would be nice <laughs> i enjoy doing the show i enjoy hosting it i enjoy writing it i enjoy hanging out with my two best friends and shitting on movies and drinking beer and and having a and just having a good time. This is just a good old fashioned good time. It makes me look forward <laughs> to Thursdays, and I hardly it, ever look forward to Thursdays. It makes me look forward to Thursdays too, because it's 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 usually my toughest day of the week, so I get to end it mm-hmm. on a good note. <laughs> so thanks again for joining us, folks. We look forward to seeing you for episode one hundred. I'm Leo. I'm Kevin. I'm Mike. Run out there right now and watch. House of a Thousand Corpses. Mm. Cheers, folks. Cheers. Cheers. It's way gorier. Yeah, the gore doesn't bother me. I, I wrote I wrote a fucking dissertation for, for the show on Saturday, like like my thoughts on that movie. <laughs> he's I've been I've been writing stuff on Twitter about it, and he's been writing stuff on Twitter, and he actually like tagged us in a tweet earlier, and he tagged Rob Zombie in the tweet too. Oh God! <laughs> and I'm like, I don't think Rob Zombie will turn into the show, but in case he does, he's going to hear me show that movie a lot. <laughs> I would tell Rob Zombie to stick to stick to music. <laughs> but I, I actually have a, I have a, I have backup for it because one of my trivia facts is about how Rob Zombie himself hates that movie. <laughs> it was his directorial debut, and he's like, when I watch it, all I see now are are the flaws. <laughs> there are a lot of them. There it was. No, I still haven't finished it yet. So, I wrote in my notes. I was, I had, I, I thought the original Willy Wonka film with Gene Wilder was scarier. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Kev. Hello, gents. How are not we? Not the today? worst. Not the worst film I've seen, but definitely not the best. You're getting close to the worst film I've seen. I felt honestly, I felt like it was 128 minutes, and uh, it was like 126 of those minutes were unnecessary. The only the only necessity was the two minutes of Rob Zombie's wife walking out of the liquor store in chaps. Is that who that is? <laughs> That's Rob Zombie's wife. Yeah, That's uh, Sherry Moon Zombie. <laughs> I think I want one of those posters that you, uh, it's a scratch off poster, but it's got like the AFI top 100. And as you oh, yeah. watch the movies, you kind of scratch off what scratch you've seen, what you haven't seen. I actually yeah. looked up, I looked up the AFI 100 recently because I was, you know, I wanted to, I was like kind of pre planning for it. And they haven't updated the list since 2012. Really? It's been a really long time since they updated the AFI list. The last the, the last movie that they added to the list was uh uh Lord of the Rings Return of the King. Oh wow. So and you know Black Panther's gonna go on that list at some point. Well, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> I'm thinking uh so that's something we can do is like I I'm gonna check again and see like when the last time was updated. 
and then we can look at some of the movies that came out in the 10 years since the last update and see like which films we think should uh, should find a place on that list somewhere yeah water boy yeah i'm also thinking like we're not going to go through all 100 films i think because i've seen a lot of them i looked at the list and was like wow i really don't have much of a fucking life because <laughs> i have watched so many movies um but I think like we could kind of do like we do with the year in history stuff where we kind of like pick out some things and maybe do the top 20 and then start scattering. And, yeah. And then kind of scatter around through them. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I am going to go crack open another one. <laughs> I am going to go take a shit. <laughs> I might do that I first. I might have to go bed. make some room. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. All right, guys. It was uh, good talking to you again. I'll see you on Saturday. Yep.